me. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is the text. <clears throat> I want to thank the Lord for the message and just pray you give it to be delivered His way. That I get out of the way of this message and um, just thank Him for it. Luke 2 is the text. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2 and verse 3 is where um, <clears throat> all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judah and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of lineage of David. Every year they had to go pay their taxes, just like we do today. Some things never change. <laughs> taxes are an annual process. It was then, it still is now. So Joseph is, is with his wife Mary, and she's pregnant with the Lord Christ Jesus. And to be, they were taxed, verse five, and um, Mary's with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there were no rooms for them in the inn. It's just like nowadays, you travel to a busy city, you don't get a hotel room. They ended up in the barn. And there were in the, the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. There's, there's this angel and there's bright light all around these shepherds in the field. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be told shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This is an amazing announcement. This is it. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. This is an innumerable quantity of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go, now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told of them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The mind of these shepherds is where I want to start the introduction of this message. What a process God took these men through to actually be approached by an angel out in the field. They'll shine the glory of God all around them. Then a host of angels, an innumerable quantity of angels there with them singing praise and glory to God, saying, the Son of God is born on this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ is here. The mind of those shepherds, in, by way of introduction, Psalm 102, look at your outline. For, for he hath looked down from the heights of the sanctuary. That's God the Father. He's looked down from heaven. And did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner. Now I got a little bit about the mind of those, those shepherds. He, those shepherds were so joyful and so happy to hear about the Lord's Christ because they knew that God heard the groaning of the prisoner. They knew they were prisoners. They were held captive to sin. They were prisoners in this lifetime, doomed to death. To loose those, that's to free those that are appointed to death. Those shepherds knew this was their Messiah. This was their Savior. And that's the whole purpose of Christ coming on this earth. You can imagine, he visited earth. We think it's amazing to go visit another country or another area in this world or even go to the moon someday. It won't be long, we'll be going to the moon for a vacation. There's no question. God Almighty came to this earth. He visited us. And these in the field that just had this amazing miracle unfold right in front of them, they knowing themselves, knew that they were prisoners, knowing that they need to be freed because they were appointed to death. They were told people. If they didn't think they were doomed of their own 
a fate of death in, in going to hell, they wouldn't have been that joyous over the Savior coming. They would have gone some other way. They would have hidden from the angels. They were joy-filled, and they had to tell people, look at verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. These shepherds were poor, broken-hearted sinners, and they were told the Messiah is on this earth. The Savior has arrived. What an amazing time. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord has arrived. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And they did. Just as the angels told them, they went and found them. And suddenly there was an angel of multitude, a heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Why is this so joyous? Why is this so happy? Because those of us that find out that we're sinners, those of us that find out during our lifetime that we're appointed to death, find out Christ died in our place for us. That he came and lived a perfect, pure, holy life to lay down his life on the cross of Calvary and to die our death for us in our place as our substitute. And he freed the prisoners. But most in this lifetime don't find out they're sinners. Most are like Cain. They've got a fruit of the field that they want to offer God. Most are like Judas. They want money. They want fame. They want to be the popular one. Most are like uh, Pharaoh. He just wanted to be king and, and dominate over God. Most in their lifetime don't come to saving awareness, and they end up being tormented in hell throughout all eternity. They don't know God savingly. They're not interested in a Messiah. They're not interested in a Savior. They want their own free will to play out with their destiny. They think they've got control over their, their destiny, and they don't. God is the only one with free will. If there was two free wills in all existence, who would win? There'd be war all the time. That's impossible to have two free wills. There's only one free will. He's called God the Father. The very Son of God the Father said, I do nothing of mine own will. All that he tells me to do, I do. All that he says, I say, I say. Christ himself does not deploy free will. The Father is the single free will in all existence, and he has predestined a particular people for Christ to come and live for and die for and save by the sacrifice of himself. And Christ came to seek and save. That's point number one. Turn to Luke chapter 19 with me. By way of introduction, what I'm trying to say is salvation isn't happenstance. Salvation to those, those guys that were just out in the field it came because it came to them. Salvation came to where they were at. They didn't go out and seek God. They couldn't. They're darkened. They're just prisoners. They're, they needed to be freed of what they fell in when, when Adam sinned, just like you and I. Luke, Luke chapter 19 is about one that was freed from his sin. And Jesus entered into and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a, na a man named Z uh, Zacchaeus, uh, Zacchaeus. Z uh, I'm sorry, help me out, Rick. <clears throat> Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. Zacchaeus. <clears throat> he was chief among the publicans. He, he, he wasn't a Jew. Zacchaeus was a publican. The Jews rejected publicans. The Jews said they weren't elect. Only Jews are elect. Jews are wrong. The elector of all the different nations, of all the different countries, of all the different people, of all the different colors of skin, the elector of particular people from the Father's mind before the foundation of the world. Zacchaeus was one of those elect, and he wasn't a Jew. And he sought to see Jesus. Zacchaeus sought and were who he was, and he couldn't. He was a short guy. Verse 4, and he ran before and climbed up on a sycamore tree to see Christ, and in the path that he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For the day I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus did not come to Christ. Christ walked right up to Zacchaeus and said, you come down on that tree right now. And he made haste and came down off the tree and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured and said, 
he was gone to be guest with a man that's a sinner. He's not a Jew. He's a publican. This, this Messiah, he came for the Jews, not publicans. No, he came for his people. He came for sinners. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my good I give to the poor. And, and if I have taken anything from any other man, false accusation, I restore him fourfold. He's full of self-righteous, foolish works. Trying to justify himself before the Lord Christ. Trying to make himself look good. Trying to make himself holy. This is sin. This is the deceit of sin. Oh, it's heinous to be immoral. And that is sin. There's no question immorality is sin. But the sin that easily beset man, the sin of Adam that we all inherited, that we felt guilty to, and that we're blind of until God's light shines upon us, is the very best of who we think we are. It's the very morsel of what we love and adore about ourselves that we think, God better receive me because I've done these things. Zacchaeus listed them out right in front of the Lord's Christ. What Jesus do? This day is salvation come to that. He ignored him. He ignored his self-righteous works. This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he is also the son of Abraham, Jesus just told the Jews around, I'm grafting this man into me. I'm making him a Jew today. A true Jew. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Apostle Paul went through the same thing. Turn with me in 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> Apostle Paul was a brilliant man. So scholarly. He was a Pharisee at a young age. That's hard to accomplish. He had to memorize God's word. He had to do all kinds of things that were perfect to every letter of the law. And he accomplished it. Paul was a brilliant man. He accomplished all of it as a young man. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul's preaching. He says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whether they affirm. Paul's revealing a little bit about what he was before he was saved. He used to preach the law is the way to save yourself. You keep the law, you be a moral person, you do the right things, like Zacchaeus thought. You'll be saved. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and for, of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for, for man-stealers, we've got that going on right now in America like crazy, for liars, for perjured persons, and for and if there be anything that is contrary to the sound doctrine, Paul boils it all down. Anything against God's holy word, that shows that you're going to hell, that you're doomed. Because God will not accept anything other than holy, perfect righteousness. And then Paul digresses a little bit and says, I'm going to tell you what grace is. The glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, Apostle Paul said, God gave me salvation, even though I was all these things. He says it here soon. And, and I thank Christ Jesus, verse 12, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. God put me into the position, Paul says, who was before. Paul's saying, I'm going to be honest with you. I was a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious. That means I took true believers and I beat them up. I even killed believers. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I did not know that my Lord and Savior lived, died, was crucified for me, and was resurrected for me. I had no knowledge. I had nothing right or good in my religious state. I was so religious, I was killing true believers. And what that did is it magnified this word grace. Verse 14, and, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul received for all the murderous Attempts he did against the believers, unearned favor from God Almighty. God came down and spoke with him and saved him. <clears throat> Thus, it is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul was not immoral. Paul was ethical. He held the traditions of the Pharisees. He did everything right according to the law that he could. 
all that righteous, religious, syrupy, self-righteous stuff bought him nothing before God Almighty. At the end of the day, he said, I'm the chief sinner. You put all the immoral acts out there and anything against God's holy, precious word, I'm the worst. I'm the very best at doing the evil stuff because I was so religious and so blind to who I am and who I was before God, I didn't even know I deserved hell. I was living my life ignorant of God Almighty, thinking I was doing God's service by killing Christians. This is who Christ came for, deceived sinners. Sinners that find out through a gospel message, I never knew what sin was. I thought sin was only immorality. I, the very best of who you are is the core of sin because you're so proud of yourself. You think so good of yourself that you don't need the Lord's Christ for salvation. You can do it on your own. That's a heinous crime against Christ. That's self-righteousness. And that's to try to share the grace and glory with God. That's to think you can save yourself. God won't share his glory with any man. He alone saves his people from their sins. He doesn't ask you for help. He did it all on the cross of Calvary with his son. 1 John 3 says it this way, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Christ, there's no sin whatsoever. In us, we're all sin. But he was manifested. He was born of a virgin. Raised up on this earth as a man, holy and pure God on this earth to take our sin on himself and to die in our place. He was made manifest. He was made real. He made a person right in front of us to take away our sins. So what did we contribute to salvation? Sin. That's all we could contribute. And we gave it our all. We were so blind to it, just like Zacchaeus, just like the Apostle Paul. But upon that conversion, upon that new eye, that new heart, that new ear that only God gives, the new soul within us, the new spirit within us, we say, I'm completely evil. My very best day is altogether vanity. That's what God's word says. And now I yield to God's word. Now I'm submissive to God's word. Now I've been made willing in the day of his power. I didn't earn any of this knowledge, any of this light, any of this wisdom. It's all been given to me by grace. And I see God is righteous alone. His son is purity. His son is righteousness. His son is goodness. And through him is salvation. Point number two. It's not of our works. Turn to John chapter 3, please. The deceit of sin is so heinous and so obvious to a believer. After true conversion, we see it. The world's walking in dark deceit, thinking that their best things about their character and conduct buys them merit before God, and God won't have anything to do with it. He does not share his glory with, with man. The glory is wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he honors Christ alone. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You believe in a Christ that died for everybody, you'll die in your sin. You believe in a Christ that died for particular people, and he grafted us into his son, making us Jews. Then you know the true Christ. You believe on this true Messiah, you're eternally free of sin and death. Verse 17, for God sent, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What well, did he save everybody? He didn't save Cain. He didn't save Judas. Pharaoh died in his sin. So who did he die for? He that believeth on him. Verse 18. In our lifetime, we will be given a new mind to know and to believe on the true Christ. Not one that we made up. Not one that we meditate on in our, from our childhood. That's foolishness and our self-righteousness. He that believeth on this true Christ, verse 18, is not condemned. But he that believeth not you believe in anything else? You're condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's only one Messiah. There's only one Savior. And this is the condemnation that light's coming to the world. That's Christ. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Those guys that were out in the field, when those angels came around them, and it was revealed that their Messiah was there, 
they saw for the first time they're evil and that they're prisoners and that they are appointed to death and that this Messiah was going to help them and save them. That's why they went around and spread the good news. They rejoiced because they found out they were the prisoner. But he that doeth truth, verse 21, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Salvation and righteousness and goodness is wrought inside Christ and inside Christ alone. Those of us that find out what true righteousness is, true light is, we look to our Savior and what he worked out for us inside the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. Salvation is wrought by God alone. Salvation is through Christ alone. Galatians 3 says it this way, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And boy, were we cursed. So much we couldn't even comprehend that we were dead in our sin. Being made a curse for us, Christ took our curse on himself. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Those that they put on a tree in the Old Testament times, that was the pathway to hell. You say that so there's a highway to hell, it's the cross. The cross was the cursed path to hell. Those that offended the law were crucified. Christ took on himself our crucifixion, our path to hell. And he blocked up that path by atoning for us, by putting his blood on the mercy seat, by satisfying the Father's demand of holy righteousness. But the sinner is, they got to die. And if there's not righteous blood shed in the place of those sinners, then they shall die. And those that Christ didn't die for, they won't ever come to saving awareness. The light of the God's counsel will never be enlightened inside their minds. And they'll perish in their sin. And you know what they'll be proud of? Themselves. How good and moral they are. Or good and how what they do to humanity and how much of an impact they are to the other people is what they're going to take comfort in. They're going to die in their sin. Luke chapter 23, please. This is Christ on the way to the cross. Luke 23, verse 27 says, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. Back in that day, they used to hire people to mourn for the people that were dying on the cross, for the prisoners. And Jesus turned to these people and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. That's a change. And for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. Christ is saying, There's a day I'm going to come back. I'm dying on that cross right now. I'm going to be buried in that earth three days. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to ascend into heaven, and I'm going to come back. My second coming, and the people that don't know me savingly, they're going to wish they never existed. They're going to wish they'd never been. They're going to curse the day of their birth. Before that, they're going to be proud of something about themselves. But that day when I come back, they're going to curse their birthday. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall they be done in a dry? And there, there were also two other malefactors led with Christ to be put to death. And, and when they were come to that place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Christ. And the malefactors, one on one, the right hand, the other on the left hand. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. The, the Apostle Paul, he's speaking about here. Apostle Paul said, I did it in ignorance. I killed Christians and I didn't even know I was doing this against God. I was ignorant. Now that I know God savingly, I, I know that he died for me. Christ saves when we don't even know that we are on offense to him. That's when he saves. That's what grace is. That's what mercy is. Mercy is you don't deserve it. It's a free gift. They don't even know what they do, and Christ is the only one given the power and authority to forgive sins, and he does it on the cross of Calvary. He says, Father, forgive them. They're ignorant of me. They don't even know who they're crucifying today. And when you crucified your Savior, you didn't know him. Look at Acts 5. I remember being so shocked the day I found out that I was guilty of the crucifixion of Christ. Before that, I thought, I didn't have anything to do with that. I wouldn't have done that if I was alive at that day. Then the Lord's mercy and spirit came upon me, and it's like, I'm guilty. 
I'm guilty of this very crucifixion. I would have spit on his face and beat him up. I did my whole life in my self-righteous acts because I communicated hatred for Christ that I had self-goodness and I didn't need a savior. I'd save myself. Acts chapter 5 verse 30 is, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Boy, may it be God show you that personally. You slew and hung him on a tree. These are the ones that find out that they're prisoners. These are the ones that find out that they're appointed to death. Guilty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm guilty. You torment me throughout eternity and I'll accept that torment because I'm guilty of his death. What a heinous crime. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be the prince and savior. He's the savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. If you find out that you're a sinner through the gospel message, if you find out that you're a prisoner, that you deserve hell and that you are hell bound, that you're there right now, that's a great place to be. That's a great place because you've been found. You've been found by the very Son of God the Father. And he was sent for you to save you from your sin and to reveal to you who you are and to reveal to you who he is, righteous, holy, Son of God, the very one that washes away sin. Hebrews chapter 7 reads, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. He's able to save those that find out that we're full of sin, full of iniquity, full of a false covering, full of, full, full of self-righteousness. He's able to save you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. The last point is he's glorified in interceding for sinners. <clears throat> Not only did Christ live perfectly, not only did Christ die in our place on the cross of Calvary and take all of our sin on himself and pay our penalty for us, and he put his blood on the mercy seat and reconciled us good before God the Father, but he was resurrected and is alive right now and is in heaven interceding on our behalf. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. We were just ignorant and asleep in sin. But Christ is our righteousness. He's our salvation. For since by man came death, by man came also the resur resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And that all is inclusive to all the Father's elect. There's not a one of us that's going to be lost. Just that he, he, he literally suffered for sins that you haven't even committed yet. All your sin is predestined. Every bit of your person is predestined. And every bit of your evil self and your self-righteous acts, your iniquity, has been put on Christ on the cross of Calvary and paid for by his blood. Man doesn't have free will. You don't get to pick your future. It's all decided for you. And thanks be to God, because you can't sin a sin outside of what he's paid for already. It's done. Does that excuse us and say, let's go out and sin? No. <clears throat> If we know Christ and are saved by his blood, we adore him and we hate ourselves. And we're obedient to his blood and we yield to him and we want to be obedient. We want to follow his word and righteousness. Verse 22 says, For as in Adam all died, even so by Christ shall all be made alive. You'll be made new in him. Your life will be different. You'll see that he paid your penalty and you'll want to be obedient to the word, not out of debt out of love for your Savior. This is what the mind that God gives a, a new believer. I want to be obedient because he satisfied the Father's demand for me. I'll no longer perish in my sin. Hebrews 7.25 in the bottom of your outline says, Wherefore he's able also to save them to the uttermost, that, that come unto God by him. You come unto God by Christ and you'll never be cast out. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, Christ is on the throne of God the Father right now, the very favor, the right hand of God the Father. And he's coming back. And for those that he's redeemed, the use of the message, his blood is precious. May it be that you see that the precious blood of Christ is what washes your sin away. That it's the precious blood of Christ that settles your guilty conscience right now in this lifetime. And it's the blood of Christ that stays and keeps you throughout eternity. His blood is so powerful and so precious and so pure that you can never fall in sin again. May it be that you see this. Rick, close us in prayer, please.